verse 5 says, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you have planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. So let's pray. Lord God, uh, may I speak and tell of the wonders that you have done. There are too many for me to declare, but say what you once said through my lips uh, these next uh, 45 minutes or so. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, one more passage here to get started is uh, from Romans chapter 4, verse 17. It says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and who calls things that are not as though they are. Um, back in, uh, in 1998, I was a instructor pilot out in the uh, Air Force out in Del Rio. And uh, yes, that is me. Uh, I have a little more expansive life now, but... Uh, but I was, I, was a, I was a runner back then, too. And um, see the brown hair? It's a little gray now, but, but that's me. And, uh, and so my job was teaching student pilots how to fly. Uh, and uh, I'd never heard of Hungary. I mean, I've heard of Hungary, but, but, but all Hungary meant to me was, a, 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 I'm, and I'm to my shame, an insignificant country with a funny-sounding name. Okay? That was, uh, was kind of what Hungary meant to me. But then... Uh, Hungary intervened in my life in a pretty real way in the person of, uh, of Joseph Jonas, um, right there with the red circle around his head. Uh, and uh, he didn't have a red circle around his head at the time. I don't think that the picture was taken, but that was uh, to point out who he was. Um, we, had, we had programs um, in the Air Force, and we still to this day, anybody who's been around the military knows this, that we train lots of foreign students from lots of countries around the world. And the idea is to bring them here, give them the best training on earth, send them back as ambassadors of goodwill, uh, that someday they become leaders in their militaries and go, America good, you know? And so, uh, and we engender goodwill abroad by doing so. And, in, and in, uh, when I showed up at, uh, at Laughlin uh, Air Force Base, that was the case. We had, uh, in every class of approximately 30, we had about uh, uh, two or three foreign students. And, um, and this class was no different. And one of them happened to be a young man named Joseph Jonas or as they would say in hung, Hungarian, Jonas Josef. Um, and, uh, and he was just like any other foreign student to me, um, other than that, uh, that he had a very unique background. He was a uh, son of a communist colonel. His father had been a colonel uh, in the communist Hungarian army, T-72 tank driver, XO of a tank brigade. Had the Cold War ever started, he would have been the first guy we'd have shot coming across the Fulda Gap. Um, in an A-10 Warthog, um, that, would, uh, that was the, the plan, but then, you know, his plans changed, communism fell, um, and, uh, and Joseph came to pilot training there at Laughlin. Uh, he was the first Hungarian ever to go west for pilot training. Out of all the other Hungarians to ever fly, he, they'd all been Soviet trained, Soviet equipment, uh, Soviet doctrine, and, and when this program came down the pipe, he was selected amongst all of his peers in a pretty rigorous competition and came to America for pilot training. With very broken English, we sent him to the Defense Language Institute to work on his conversational English uh, that we paid for. Um, and, uh, and then he ended up across the table from me. So I, you know, he was an outstanding student, um, uh, very uh, good to fly with. And uh, it... Um, the, the thing that intrigued me the most, though, was his background. Um, he was raised in the Soviet Union. Um, in fact, he even went to grade school, second, third grade, in Moscow, as his father did some training with the Soviet Army. Uh, that is him, again, with the red circle around his head. Um, couldn't have posed that one better if we'd have tried. Uh, him right in the middle, you know, his head held high. That's his father directly behind him, and his mother slightly to his right, uh, Maria, and his father, Joseph, as well with a bunch of other officers from the Warsaw Pact, uh, countries, uh, East Germany, Bulgaria, et cetera, et cetera, there in Moscow. And so a true child of the Soviet Union uh, and an eyewitness to the fall of communism, well, my formative years were exactly the opposite of that. I was, my father was a colonel in the U.S. Air Force and, and pilot and an intel officer. And, you know, the Reagan buildup, we're going to throw down with the Red Horde, uh, Red Storm Rising, the hunt for Red October, all those kind of things were formative in my years. And so I was very intrigued to have a real live son of a commie, you know, right here in my cockpit flying with me. And, um, 
And so uh, one day I, I asked him in the flight room, I said, Joseph, I said, look, you know, I'm intrigued by your background, mine's the opposite of that. Uh, what was it like? What was it like growing up in a communist country? And his, his response to me goes, well, it wasn't all bad. At least they didn't make you go to church. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And so that kind of set me aback. And, and, uh, and because I was, I was Christian, uh, Christy, we had small children at the time. We were Christians. Most of our limited discretionary time was spent at the church, you know, doing Christian things. And so I told him, I said, look, I'm intrigued that you would answer, you know, at least you didn't have to go to church. I'm a Christian. We go to church all the time. Um, why are you citing that as a positive about communism? And, uh, and he, was, he was just joking. But, but the reality behind the joke was he was an atheist. Everyone he knew was atheist. He had never even had a conversation, period, dot, about Christ. Nothing. We never even mentioned in his home. And um, so we had a conversation. We talked about a few things. It was pretty casual. Um, it was a right about that time that he moved on to a different flight. It was not my student anymore. Um, Alps part one, Alps part two, he moved to the second part. And, uh, but I tracked him down a couple more times and talked to him while he was there. And when he was getting close to graduation, I just felt a strong conviction to give him a Bible. Now, being a pilot, um, I'm cheap. I went to Walmart and I bought the cheapest paperback study Bible I could find. I didn't even get the, the fake leather. Um, but, uh, but I bought him a Bible and I wrote a bunch of stuff in the cover uh, that was germane to what we had talked about. I called him up and said, hey, Joseph, I know you're graduating soon. Is there a time I can come by? I have a gift I want to give you upon your graduation. And, uh, and so we, we found a mutually agreeable time. I went by his dorm room on the base, and I said, hey, Joseph, I said, you, you're a good stick, which is a nice, great way of saying you're a good pilot. Um, you're a great stick, no problems flying. And I'd heard that he had just met a girl in a bar there in Del Rio, local homegrown American girl, Lori Sanchez. And... Um, and, uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd heard he had a girlfriend. So I said, look, you can get the girl, you can get the jet, you can get everything you think is going to make you happy. And his, his life goal was to be a MiG-21 pilot. That, that was the frontline fighter in Hungary. And that's what he'd seen, you know, raging over the Danube as a child. So you, you can get all that, and it won't satisfy the soul. He said, only a relationship with Christ will do that. So um, the, uh, said, so here's a gift from me to you, a Bible. And I uh, talked about some of that, and uh, I said, so read that Bible. And i got to tell you, Joseph, I don't know what it is. I believe God's got a unique plan at work in your life. And uh, this is actual excerpts from what I wrote to Joseph on that day from his Bible. Wrote a bunch of other stuff, but this is what I'll conclude it. I said, as you go back home in a few weeks, um, chances are I will never see you again in this life. It is my prayer that I will see you in heaven in the presence of God, enjoying his unimaginable reward for those that love him. Jesus offers you the chance of living a life with a purpose that is divinely guided by his loving hand, culminating in eternal life. Or you can reject him and continue to chase after the wind, resulting in eternal damnation and separation from all that is good. God forces himself on no one and it is your choice to make. That was 10 September 1998. Uh, I didn't mince words, never had with Joseph. And, um, and uh, we had talked a lot about Ecclesiastes, that everything is just chasing after the wind. It's, 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 you're not going to catch it. Um, and so that's what I left him with. And he was very grateful that I, uh, that I gave him a Bible. Uh, not so much the Bible, but the fact that I cared enough about him to give him a gift, which was very European and Hungarian, which I had no idea at the time, but I just, but I did. And I was the only one that did, by the way. And uh, they gave him any gift um, in terms of his departing. So he graduated uh, about three weeks later. That's him um, with another uh, officer there in the Air Force. And, uh, and, you know, I saw him. I actually met uh, Lori that day, um, first time I met her and said hello. And, and, and off they go. And, you know, I moved on to the next uh, foreign student that came down, my, down the pipe. Well, a few months later, I got a letter from, uh, from Joseph and said, uh, Dear Captain Wilson, you know, I just wanted to thank you for, for giving me that, uh, that gift. Um, not that I ever intend on reading it, reading between the lines. But, uh, but you know, I appreciate it. And, uh, and, hey, Lori's living in my parents' flat in Mesotour. And we're getting married next month. And I uh, just wanted to tell you all that, which I was shocked. That it, uh, you know, there's a man of action, uh, took, took his new girlfriend back to Hungary, which had to have been a pretty significant culture shock for her. 
Um, and, uh, and so they did, they got married. Um, that is not actually their wedding day. Um, they got married in December, I think it was. And, uh, and, and then a few short months later, grad Joseph graduated at the top of his class at the Hungarian Military Academy, was commissioned uh, as an officer in the Hungarian Air Force. That is in a bridge, very picturesque spot right across from the plaza out in front of the uh, Parliament building on the Danube, one of the most beautiful places in all of Europe if you ever get a chance to go there. Um, but uh, that's the day Joseph became an officer in the Hungarian Air Force. And soon thereafter, living the dream, flying MiG-21s. There he is with a whole line of MiG-21s you see there in the background, and three of his buddies, and, uh, and uh, doing a little hand flying there um, off the top of MiG-21. And, uh, and sure enough, there he is, uh, finally achieved a lifelong dream of hard work, only to have it all crash and burn. He got 12 hours in that MiG-21 when the chief of staff of the Hungarian Air Force came on national television and said, um, sorry, it's been a change of plans. Um, we're closing two out of three Hungarian air bases, grounding all of the MiG-21s, and you're out of a job. Um, actually, he wasn't out of a job because they were not gonna fire him because he'd gotten all this good training from their new NATO ally uh, and didn't want us coming over there going, hey, where's Jonas? And like, uh, Jonas who, you know, but uh, they were going to assign him to a MiG-29 squadron and not let him fly where they had three planes or five planes, two of which were flyable and 40 guys trained to fly him. He wasn't going to get to fly. Um, so about that time, um, I got a letter from Joseph in October of 2000 laying all this out saying, I'm not going to waste my life in this outfit. Um, I'm resigning my commission in the Hungarian Air Force. I'm immigrating to the United States. I am moving back in with my in-laws in their spare bedroom in Del Rio. And if there's any way to be a pilot in your Air Force, that's what I want to try to do. And if you think I'm worth it, would you be willing to help me? All right, another scripture. 1 Corinthians 1, 20. It says this. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Well, let me tell you, the wisdom of the world says, no way, no how, ain't going to happen. Don't waste your time. That's the impossible dream. Okay? And let me tell you why, just a few reasons why that was a highly unlikely, impossible dream that Joseph um, uh, pinned to me. One, uh, he was 25 years old, so he was going to get here in January 2001, which would be one week shy of his 25th birthday. Um, it would take, as a legal resident alien, three years to, become, to apply for citizenship. Uh, about a year conservatively to go through that process, which would leave him 29 years old, and he had to be in pilot training flying by age 30. Um, that's one year from citizenship to become an officer in the Air Force, be selected to be an officer, become an officer, selected to be a pilot and in pilot training. That is in an extremely short time frame. For anyone who's ever dealt with the bureaucracy, the government, military, whatever, you know that is a, a very compressed time frame. Um, to do that, he would need a four-year college degree accredited in the United States. Hungarian Military Academy is not. Um, he would need to compete um, with all the other officers uh, in the country that are also wanting to be pilots. Uh, one very critical aspect of the story that I forgot to tell earlier on, the day, what got Joseph interested in flying back when he was his child in the Soviet Union, his father brought home a pirated copy of Top Gun, okay? And on this, this is, this is about a couple months before communism toppled across Eastern Europe. 13-year-old Joseph followed 1989. Uh, he's watching Top Gun with a German speaking over the Hungarian and in, in a, in a translating from English and a Hungarian translating in German. So three different languages going on this, this, uh, this movie. But the international language of fast jets and beautiful women came through loud and clear. And, and Joseph said, I want to be a pilot. Um, and so that's, that's how he got interested in flying. And that day, this is, this is communist child hung, Joseph wrote on his Hungarian songbook. He had a guitar book. He wrote, Joseph Jonas, Major United States Air Force that day, okay? So here we are, um, now he's back in America trying to become an American pilot and he's gotta compete with all the guys who watch Top Gun in English who, uh, <laughs> who also want to be a pilot. But not only that, to get the opportunity to compete, he would need a waiver from the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the highest 
ranking uh, officer in the Air Force, four-star general. Those are hard to come by, let me tell you. Um, and, uh, and even if the chances of getting a security clearance with his background, uh, slim to none and slim just left town, okay? Uh, so again, the, uh, the conventional wisdom, eh, let him down easy. <laughs> you know, tell him uh, whatever you want to tell him, uh, but don't waste your time. So what did I do? I wrote him back and said, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and uh, here's actual, actual excerpts from the letter I wrote Joseph in October. No, actually, it's 10 November 2003. Um, no, I'm sorry, 10 November 2000. It's this fall 2000. I wrote a bunch of other stuff, but I basically said, I certainly don't know all the powers that be. I'm just a lowly reserve instructor pilot. Okay? I don't know the powers that be, but I guarantee you I know people who do. Um, it goes without saying that I'll be happy to help you in whatever way I can, even with our significant problems, and there are some very serious ones that we can discuss later. Uh, the USA is still the land of opportunity and the best country on earth. And I must say that if, we, if all this works for you the way that you want it to go, you will find it does not bring true and lasting soul satisfaction. Only a personal relationship with Jesus Christ will do that. So that was from my letter that I wrote him back saying, come on down, let's do it. Um, so he got here, and uh, there he is, back in Del Rio, in my backyard, laying sod. A um, little trend with me, we laid some sod in my yard last week. Um, but uh, me on the, the right uh, hand, that's him uh, on the left with the uh, little pick there. And there's a little Sawyer supervising down there, sitting, uh, <laughs> sitting on the chair, helping out as she does the best, um, watching. And, uh, just kidding. and, and so, so in the summer, spring of 2001, in the summer of 2001, that was what we did. Um, and as Lori and Christy is my witness, we hit the ground running. We, there was not a stone that we left unturned to try to pull this thing off. We had plans A, B, C. Plan A was to try to get him hired as a reservist in a guard or reserve unit knowing that those people could, would know him, like him, want to hire him, lead turn all those issues, make them all go away upon his citizenship with a slot for him to walk into. That was the only way we conceived it possible. And so uh, I learned a very valuable, only Russian I know, one very valuable phrase in Russian is malanki robot. Uh, it means we got a little work to do. And, uh, and by this point in our relationship, I was calling him Uchi. Uchi is what his friends and family called him back in Hungary, which means little brother. So he was like a little brother to me and say, Uchi, Malinki robot, I got work to do at my house. Get over here, let's work. And so, uh, and so during that time, we would debate. I would proselytize. I'd beat him over the head of the Bible. When we were done, we'd go inside and watch Veggie Tales with Sawyer and Bailey. Yeah, we, I mean, we tried everything we knew um, to, to try to poke holes through his false, secular, humanist, atheistic, Darwinistic, Leninist worldview, which, uh, as Gabi and Mara can say, that's a pretty entrenched worldview from, from Hungary. And, um, and it always came back to this. He didn't believe there was a God, and I did. And so one day, probably dressed very similar to that, may have been that very day, uh, as he was about to get on his bike and ride home, he'd never had a car, really, of his own, and uh, so he was gonna ride his bicycle back across town. We stood out under a pecan tree in my front yard, and, uh, and I said, Joseph, look, I know that you may think that you got this wild idea to come over here and be a, a fighter pilot, I would say this God that you don't believe in has been steering your ship from day one. Witness the fact that it was an American movie that inspired you to fly. Out of all the places on earth, you were the first Hungarian to go west for pilot training, and God took you to Texas, to the edge of the earth there in Del Rio, put you across the table from me, told me to give you a Bible, and told me to tell you that you had a unique plan at work in your life, and you've got to admit, if we pull that off, this is unique. Yep, can't argue with that. I said, so... Um, if I am correct and God is, is steering this thing, it is incumbent upon us to run as hard as we can in the direction of what God's doing. We're not just going to sit back and watch it, but I would like to trust it into his sovereign hand. Um, so I'd like to pray and ask him to help us. And if you're right and there's no God, nothing ventured, nothing, you've got nothing to lose by praying. So let's pray. So I was okay with him. So we stood in my driveway. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Dear Lord, thanks for bringing Joseph over here. You know what we're trying to do. If it's your will that he become a pilot, please open the doors necessary to make it happen or close the doors necessary to make it happen. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And when I said that, he said to me, why would you ask God to close a door? 
I said, because God doesn't work the way we think he's going to work. Um, what we consider a closed door is often an open door that leads to success. And, uh, and so he, that sounded good to him, and he hopped on his bike and, and rode home. That was August of 2001. A short month later, September 11th, 2001, slam dunk closed door. Okay, our plan A, get him higher to the guard reserve, suffice it to say, didn't work. We didn't even get close. Um, plan B was to try to get him hired as a ramper at Southwest, and he could, he could work in Houston on the ramp around airplanes and try to pledge the F-16 unit at Ellington there, you know, and get to know those guys and try to work it from that angle. Uh, well, that day, 9-11, you know, Continental furloughed 12,000 people. Southwest announced a hiring freeze. He ain't getting hired in the airline industry, and no one else is either. So uh, plan C was Jesus Christ, and, uh, and that was not a plan that he necessarily bought into. And so on the week of, uh, of 9-11, Joseph Jonas, in word and deed, gave up on his dream of being an Air Force pilot. His lifelong dream of being a pilot, he let it go and said, um, and his logic was, look, I'm going to be an American. If I ever have children, they're going to be Americans. Um, he was outraged by the events of 9-11. He didn't want a handout. He didn't stand in the street. I'm here. Give me, give me, give me, give me. He said, do I want to show that there's nothing that I'm not willing to do? And that week, he enlisted in the United States Army, from an officer in Hungary to an enlisted man in the Army, and incurred a six-year active duty service commitment to the Army, which took him beyond the age of ever being an Air Force pilot. So this was, this was a closed deal for him. And I told him, I said, Joseph, I know you've given up. I have not, okay, because I serve a big God who can do big things. I don't know how this is going to happen, but, but uh, I haven't given up. So off he goes to the Army, um, where he excelled in everything he, he might as touch, top of every class he came out of. And, and, when the, uh, and, and all I did was pray. That's all I could do is pray. Um, and so from September 11th of 19, or 2001, through the 4th of July, 2002, I prayed that God would open that door that we'd, we'd asked him to. Reading the Houston Chronicle uh, on 5th of July down in my parents' home, just a small throwaway article. Previous day, George Bush signed an executive order saying all foreign nationals serving in the war on terror, immediately eligible for citizenship, has to thank them for serving our country and enable them to further their military careers by being eligible for programs only open to U.S. citizens. I said, that's us. Taylor made. That's what we're looking for. So I called him. You sitting down, Joseph? And I read it to him. And uh, and he uh, he viewed it the same way I did as an opportunity, a window of opportunity. Immediately applied for citizenship. And the army said, Hey, great. I mean, the Air INS. It's going to take six to nine months uh, before you become a citizen. Which you know, you know, call me crazy. I'm thinking you know his commander should raise the right hand the following day and swear him in. That's not the way the bureaucracies work. And that would be okay. We could wait that. But remember, our five-year clock, we've already got about a year and a half or more burning into this window. Time, like sands through the hourglass, it's chipping away. Nine months just to wait for citizenship. Not only that, but all the other the obstacles I've laid out for you, we also now had the problem, we've got to get him out of the Army. He's, you know, Army's going to war. We're fighting in Afghanistan. The storm clouds of war are brewing for Iraq. Uh, Colin Powell's at the United Nations make the case to go to war. And if he leaves the country before the citizenship thing's done, all bets are off. You could not become a citizen from overseas. That has since changed. You see these guys swearing in in Saddam's palace? This is the summer of 2003, and that was not the case. So we have an added layer of stress going on. So I re-engaged with the Air Force, and suffice it to say, this took from July to December. Lots of letters, lots of phone calls. I eventually went to a colonel friend who went to a brigadier general friend who went down the chain of command, and we bashed this colonel until we got the Air Force on board. And, uh, and in, in December 2002, the Air Force, uh, 2003, no, two, two, get, I have a hard time keeping it straight, too. Um, Air Force is on board, and all we're waiting for is citizenship. And eight months into our wait for citizenship, Joseph goes to war. So we were that close, Whew. only see it disappear into the ether, and there he is fighting in, uh, in Iraq, and, uh, and so his wife and I, Lori, said, look, we will not let your dream wither on the vine while you're gone, and he was gone. I mean, there's no cell phones, there's no computers, there's, he's gone, there's no talking. Uh, we don't even know where he's at. 
He's on the border of Iraq and, and Afghanistan, I mean, Iraq and Kuwait, putting together the helicopters. When the, when the war kicked off in March, first week in March 2003, Joseph air assaulted with the 101st Airborne Division, uh, door gunner on the uh, 50 cal. They fought their way across southern Iraq, ended up in Mosul, northern Iraq. If you remember when Uday and Kusay Hussein were killed, he was a part of that operation. So while he's doing all that, um, Lori and I said, the INS could give us, said it may take nine months, we'll give them 10. But if 10 comes and goes, we're going to start raising cane. So eight months, nine months, 10 months. I had Lori flying to Del Rio. I made an appointment for her and I to see the mayor of Del Rio. Didn't know her, but we met in her kitchen on a Friday night at nine o'clock, told her the whole story, said, we need help. And so she wrote, the president wrote Senators K. Bailey Hudson and John Cornyn, uh, Congressman Henry Bonilla, and we got nothing in response for two and a half months. So a full year after uh, Joseph had been declared early eligible for citizenship, we got nothing. During that time, so nothing is going our way. I mean, we're really, truly not. Um, some pretty significant things happened. Uh, they finally got email up and running. You could, you could dodge you know, mortars across the base and stand in line for an hour to get you know, your 10 minutes on the, on the computer. And so we would email back and forth with Joseph a little bit. It wasn't intended to be this way, but we got in this heavy duty spiritual discussion of, of all of the above. Um, and it all started because Lori, in one of her really brief phone calls where she got to talk to Joseph said, Joseph, this is not working out for you because you refuse to accept Jesus Christ. I was shocked, frankly, that she had said that. Lori was raised Catholic on the border in Del Rio, a Christian, but Christianity had truly not been very significant in her life most of her grown up years. As I worked with Lori, it was clear that the spirit was awakening in Lori and she was starting to see things the way I saw it. And, and that's what she said to Joseph. Well, that had the effect of him doing backflips flat on the back on his cot there. And, um, and he, we engaged about all that. Well, and I'm gonna read you some actual emails. Got them all right here. Um, I save things. And, uh, and this is just, really, this is all of them right here. There's a whole book of them, but I'm just going to read you a couple lines. Um, this is from Joseph, uh, and this is dated uh, 5th of July, 2003, from Iraq. And uh, it says, Hua, a good army guy, start off, Hua. And, and that brings me to more knocking. Let me back up. Joseph had said in previous emails, hey, look, you know, this whole God thing, um, you didn't know this, I've never told you this, but God began knocking on my door back when a little girl gave me a, in Hungary, before communism fell, gave me a copy of a book about a MiG-21 pilot who'd become a Christian. So the knocking began before I ever even came to you. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, this is what he said. Um, and that brings me to more knocking. To the backyard labor, which I just showed you a picture of. I mean, counseling sessions with Cliff. Uh, the St. James experience. Oh, and I gotta say this. This was another thing that happened in the summer of 2001. Uh, Joseph needed a job, but he, he wanted to be readily available. So the only job we were able to get him is a substitute teacher at St. James Episcopal School. Okay? And I'm serious. You think our Christian school has problems. They got an they got a atheist teacher. Um, and, uh, and so... So Christy and I, we went to, we went to, to teachers at St. James and go, look, look, I know he's an atheist, but we're working on him, okay? You're going to love him. And so he would go there and he'd teach and, uh, and uh, every morning he'd have to take the prayer request from all the children and, and uh, forward them up. And they'd hit, sing songs like, God told Noah to build him an arky, arky God. And, uh, and you're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag. And, for and so that's what he did when he wasn't working in my backyard. So here he is alluding to it. He says, uh, the St. James experience, which lasts up to the day with the kids having sent me letters of encouragement. Uh, that, th thanks to Christy, because he, he realized the only reason he'd be there is Christy later credibility on the line. No, I don't think I got the job because of my qualifications. Uh, it was more like probably Christy said, hey, put this guy on the list, please. And they said like, well, if you think a guy who needs spelling classes more than the first graders should substitute, okay. Um, it's your girls too. And they put my name on the list. In the morning prayer at St. James, if, if the morning prayer at St. James does not touch your heart, you are made of stone. 
heartless and not worthy of converting oxygen to carbon dioxide. Uh, and the army, uh, with this deployment to the Middle East, I guess, poor Lori was trying a little bit of time patiently. This is what she gets for marrying a hard-headed dude. Uh, through the books Cliff gave me, I read, and I, I took a cognitive approach to faith, which I think is kind of a dead-on for a science-minded guy like me, because I will look for answers endlessly. And you, Cliff, put it so well. We do not have all the answers, but I got a good joke for you as, as, for a science-minded guy. The peoples of Earth decided that they do not need God anymore since they were so advanced in all areas of science and technology that they think they can still do it all. So. They send me one of the main brains to God to let him know, and God is presented with the idea, and he promises a little trial. Well, if you're so good, let's get back to the basics and see if you can create a man out of dirt. Well, the scientist got a swoopy laptop and attaches it to the whole bunch of tubes, leans forward, picks up some dirt. Then God says, wait a minute, get your own dirt. <laughs> All right. So then he says from there, so where was I? So I'm getting encouraged here. Hey, some of this stuff is sticking, okay? So where was I? Yes. Through personal experience, I do not quite believe in coincidences anymore. It takes, me, takes more of a leap of faith to do that, in my case, than to believe in an overall orchestrator. So why then have I come to the conclusion in the last couple of days that it is not for me? Could have hit Christy and I like a ton of bricks. It wouldn't have hurt worse. It's not for me. Christianity is not for me. Um, down here at the bottom, he says, uh, let me try to sum it up. He kicked the door open. God did. Kicked the door open. I do not know how long he will stand there. Maybe I'll have to chase him down later when the knocking has stopped. Or maybe for a while I won't see that sunrise again on the day of judgment when we will wave each other one last goodbye as I'm herded away from the sheep where you guys will be with the Lamb of God. But then I'll know that I was honest, because I could lie to you, and I could see the same way on Judgment Day looking at me, all of you knowing I betrayed you. We, we are what we leave behind in personal relationships, but for ourselves, all we have is the truth of our word, because I know I can live, I can lie even to myself. Do, do not we all do or did that? But he knows our hearts and our minds better than ourselves. I tried the hardest to make sense. Lori apologized for being so outspoken, and Cliff did as well for being so straightforward. If anybody on the surface of the earth does not have to apologize for being honest with me, it's you guys. In parentheses, hmm, Christy did not have to apologize for anything. <laughs> That's my wife. Um, thank you all for accepting me who I am. I thought for a moment to say sorry, but I was too blunt. Uh, if I did not make a lot of sense, I know you all will understand. Please try. I'm the same guy who I was yesterday, maybe a little more understanding, and I love you all, and that includes the girls and Jake, which was our dog, and the cats, and you get the point, Joseph. That was devastating to Christy and I. So um, I wrote uh, Joseph back, a very straightforward, <laughs> did not pull any punches email. I think he probably trashed that one. But a few weeks later, or a few days later, Christy wrote him an email. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read just a couple lines of it. It said, Joseph, I know I said I wanted to keep things light since recent emails have been pretty weighty, but just went back over the emails you sent, and I feel like I need to respond. I'm go just going to walk you through the letters and highlights of a few things that stood out to me. These are all from your emails. And she, point by point by point, refuted his garbage with Scripture. Okay? Uh, he had every excuse in the book. I wasn't raised that way. I didn't blah, 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 blah. And she just took it line by line and, uh, and refuted it. And here's what she concluded. She said, this is from a song the girls learned at Bible school this summer. A, B, C uh, is a decision to become a Christian. The Bible says admit, believe, confess. A, admit to God that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is God's son. C, confess with your faith as uh, Jesus as your Savior and Lord. It's as simple as ABC. Uh, in your last email, you mentioned that I was one who did not have anything to apologize for. I still don't. God's word needs no apology. You should know you're loved when you're treated like family. That's just what, that's just what I'm doing here. I present this to you if you are my own flesh and blood, uh, as if you were my own flesh and blood, because I love you and I care for you that much. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, Proverbs 27, 6. A friend loveth at all times, Proverbs 17, 17. 
What it comes down to is this question presented to you from God, the Father, when the days of this life are through. You've been given Jesus. Now, what are you going to do with him? 1 John 4, 19, love Christy. Joseph carried that email around in his wallet for about two years. Um, so right after that, got a letter from Sarah, a call from Mayor Akla. Hey, we got a call from Senator John Cornyn. He wants to help. What can he do to help? I said, I'll take that call. And so over the next two or three days, I called Lori. Lori, you email Joseph, you tell him this. Called Sergeant Davis, the guy, the recruiter had been working with him. You do this. And he said, you do that. And so basically, long story short, we took the good name of Senator John Cornyn and we bashed everyone who stood in our way. Okay, we bashed every government bureaucracy, the Army, uh, the Air Force, uh, the INS, and against all odds, in October 2003, uh, we got Joseph sent home from the war zone right at the height of the war on the back of a C-17 to be sworn in as a U.S. citizen in Dallas, Texas, um, uh, in the first week in October, of, uh, or second week in October of 2003. Uh, I was there. Uh, that's me giving a little speech. I violated one of my major goals. Uh, I never wanted to wear anything but a flight suit in the Air Force, but I put on my blues just to, for the occasion there. And, uh, and, and it was wonderful. It was a tremendous opportunity. Um, great soul satisfaction for all that were there to have pulled that off. Joseph went back to Iraq and, uh, and pretty soon um, was flying back into combat to join his unit. The day he was infiltrating back into country, two helicopters from the 101st Airborne uh, collided, killing everyone on board. It took me about three, three days to confirm he wasn't on it, um, but he wasn't, and, uh, and so he went back to Iraq. Uh, a couple more verses here I want to read. Um, Gabi and Mara alluded to this earlier today. Revelation 3.20 says... Um, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Um, Mark 2, or 10, 27 says, um, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. So, uh, Joseph goes back to Iraq. Um, flew in combat every night with the American flag uh, given to him by Senator Cornyn and his staff um, in combat, survived the war, came home. Uh, the board that we were looking for was meeting a couple weeks later. We were reaching for the Holy Grail, only to have the Army say, stop loss. No one can get out of the Army, and... Uh, and we're activating the Ready Reserve. I don't know if you guys remember that in January 2004, but we remember it. And uh, right when we were standing on the brink of victory, having overcome four major government bureaucracies to get to where we were, the Army put a freeze on his package, and he didn't hit the board. It didn't apply to him, this stop loss, because we had his release from the Army signed by General David Petraeus himself, commander of the 101st Airborne Division, but it took the Army three weeks to figure out, and we missed the board. And let me tell you, that was the low ebb. You could have hit us both in the gut, and, uh, and I don't think it would have been worse. Um, it just seemed like everything was aligned against us happening. But we waited another four months. They said there may be another board in four months. If we've waited that long, and again, our time's clicking away, then we can keep waiting. The board met in the middle of May. The results were supposed to be out no later than last week in May. First week in June 2004, President uh, Ronald Reagan passed away. And on the day he was being eulogized by Margaret Thatcher for having the singular vision to see that communism would topple under the weight of its own lies and having the fortitude to press down upon it at every weak point until it did, I got a phone call from Sergeant Davis right there. I said, we got the results. And we're celebrating the Air Force's newest pilot selectee, Specialist Joseph Jonas, United States Army. I don't even have time to tell you. Maybe you come to lunch, I'll tease you with this. I'll tell you how they told him, but it was pretty funny. Um, in any case, at the end of the day, Davis drove up to Fort Campbell, uh, personally in front of the assembled, uh, his aviation battalion with Lori. They called her at work, got out of work. Uh, there he was with his commander, being congratulated for being picked up by an Air Force, Air Force to be a pilot. And the following, I don't know how Davis did it, three weeks later, 
I swore him into the Air Force in Nashville. He went off to officer training school. I know people have waited over a year for that. We had momentum on our side. He went to OTS. While he was there, I got him assigned back to Laughlin, to Del Rio, to pilot training one last time. Um, and, uh, and on the first week in, um, well, one other thing, he, he reported for pilot training in Del Rio less than one year from becoming a U.S. citizen, which was our goal all along. Goal all along. And, um, and it happened. And so he had one week where he could take off. He went back uh, where, where uh, Fort Campbell was experiencing a, an epic baby boom. The division came home in January, and now there's 600 babies due at Fort Campbell in uh, October of... Uh, of uh, 2004, one of them being Maria Jonas, um, and uh, Oprah Winfrey had had Lori and all these 600 women on her show uh, for the, the mother of all baby showers there at Fort Campbell, gave them all $4,000 worth of baby stuff, and so the one week Joseph had off in this whole deal, he was home for the natural birth of his firstborn child, Maria. Um, came back, started pilot training at the Thanksgiving break about a month later. He relocated his wife and daughter, and I think her mother had stayed there with her while he was gone. And in January of 2005, um, there's baby Maria, her grandmother Maria, Joseph's mother, first time to America, uh, Lori's mother, Sita Sanchez. Um, his first flight as an American was my last flight in the Air Force. And so there we are gathered in the building at Laughlin. I started it by making a speech and I said, finally brothers, that's his father by the way. Um, there I am, there's little Sawyer and Bailey and my mother there in the background. We had about 30 people from all over the world there to, to watch us, including four cold warriors, okay? Um, his father, Colonel in the Hungarian Army, my father, Colonel in the US Air Force, his father-in-law, Marine door gunner Vietnam and the Marine Corps, uh, Huey gunships. My father-in-law, Arnold, uh, wounded five times in Korea uh, in the Korean War. Um, all there to celebrate us bringing this together. And, uh, and so I started the speech by saying, and finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, his story, all the above. And you can see I would stop about every two sentences, and I'm crying back there, as you can see. Um, and he would translate into Hungarian for his parents that were there. It was a wonderful experience. And so they all followed us out of there, out to the flight line, where I strapped on the T-6 for the last time and him for the first time. Uh, we strapped on, did our walk around, climbed on in, and, uh, and there we go. Took flight. Um, great way to end my career and great way to start his. And, um, and so, um, let me read one more passage of scripture here. Um, it says, well, actually, let me get to that in just a minute. Um, so, obviously, a very emotional high for us. Um, the thrill of victory followed by the agony of defeat for me. Um, we couldn't sell our home. That's, we moved to Brenham right after that. Uh, some of you who remember that, uh, we ended up moving in the spare bedroom of a friend. Uh, it was a really trying, pruning time for us. Joseph went on to finish number one in his class, totally aced the program, as I knew he would do. Um, ended up selecting uh, an A-10 Warthog, the very plane designed to kill his father. Um, uh, and uh, so a dream come true again for him. We moved to Del Rio. Uh, it was a very trying time, I mean to Brenham. Finally, our house sold the following January, January 2006. Joseph had graduated. He had a bunch of training he was going to. Uh, he had to go to survival training, water survival training, an introduction to fighter fundamentals, and then off to Tucson to learn to fly the A-10. And our house sold. I drove back to Del Rio one last time, my last night ever there, um, you know, kind of concluding our move to Brenham. It was a Friday night. I didn't know if Joseph and, and Lori were even in town. Uh, but I called him, hey, you guys around? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Let's go have dinner. And so uh, there he is. Um, and I said, uh, why don't you guys meet me downtown? So we did. 
we went and uh, had dinner, and at the end of dinner, with the sun setting over Del Rio there on the border, Joseph said, I just wanted to tell you, I just got back from Air Force survival training while sitting up in my prison camp cell in solitary confinement for 16 hours, um, I accepted Christ. And I said, Joseph, I've been calling you Uchi for all these years, but this is the first time I can truly call you my brother. And so, here we are. Um, uh, what happened after that? Well, let me read um, one more passage here from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 46, chapter 8, or chapter 48, 46, verses 8 through 11. Remember this. Fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what will still, is still to come, I say my purpose will stand, and I will do what I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. So God summoned from the east a bird of prey. Um, put him in an A-10 warthog, defending our country. Um, he ended up going to Afghanistan, flying 300 combat hours in Afghanistan. And every single one of those sorties, he had the American flag in his cockpit um, presented to him by Senator John Cornyn. Um, he got the chance to go to Top Gun and turned it down. That's right. Um, and to this, in this day, today, um, he's flying T-38s at Shepard Air Force Base up in Wichita Falls and is an instructor pilot in T-38. Um, Little Hungarian child of the Soviet Union who wrote Joseph Jonas, Major United States Air Force. His major's board meets this December. That's right. That's right. I have a four-year-old son. You, most of you know him as Gage. Full name, Joseph. Hungarian spelling, J-O-Z-S-E-F. Gage Wilson, named after my friend Joseph and his communist father. If you'd have told me that had ever happened, I'd have had a hard time believing it. Um, <laughs> I'm attempting to write a book about all of the above. Um, the, when you propagate the Great Commission and you take advantage of those opportunities that God is bringing your way, you have no idea what worlds may be opening up to you if you'll just be faithful and do those things. And so our hope for this book, for this effort, for all of the above, is that we can shout to the world the overwhelming sufficiency of our great God, the God who still calls things that are not as though they are, and who does what he says he will do. And with that, Joseph, got a few words? through a couple of a couple of trips, but let's do it one So thanks a lot. My brother. And, and I'll read this now, uh, the presentation that I'll on the line here. But the uh, people who surround you is the uh, people who fellowship them. That's uh, what I think matters to me most. I was at the, at the end of this uh, the, this uh, graduate power training, and then you know, now what? Well, it isn't just like, just like this, uh, you know, it doesn't bring really me true satisfaction. Uh, Lori was pregnant with our second daughter, and, um, and you know, for kind of the, the, the next chapter of our life, and, and that's when I realized that you know this is you know, Cliff has been right all along. It's uh, it's Cliff and Christy. So, uh, when I say Cliff, I always think of Cliff and Christy. So you can't you can't say yeah. that. <laughs> so they have been uh, uh, they have been our family when we moved to the area. So. Uh, and while and that house looks good, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> it did. Uh, I think that some work over there, but I think I tried to get uh, to the uh, I guess he should have woke me up earlier at like 60 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so all these things kind of left to it, and I uh, and could say I'm slow, slow learner, but uh, eventually I realized, you know what, Cliff is right. And the example that I've seen in front of me, uh, the way Cliff and Chris lead their life, uh, Lori 
got the glory in my way back in the days. And it was not a Sunday school to stop going to that or I'd stop this and it's just more of a reason. So that's the way it happens. It's, it's really, it's been, a, it's been a true blessing and it took me so long to realize. I guess sorry about that. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, that's what you have to know. If you know Cliff and Christy, I think uh, uh, <coughs> that's really for us. It's been, it's been a blessing, and through them, we met great people. And uh, I, I really appreciate uh, appreciate the whole love that you guys showed us. So, uh, and you trusted uh, me to teach uh, Sorry I Bailed. <laughs> Again, that's that's really the the bottom line for me. So, the people you surround yourself with, and uh, and, and that's probably the biggest challenge that I see. And I, I had the luxury of having the Josephs straight for Christ, you know, with, with Christian and Lori and then all the people. But uh, probably that's uh, one of the challenges, uh, Mara and Godly face is um, there are people there with uh, years and, and decades of of, uh, of, of all these uh, reservations, and uh, it makes it very difficult for them. But now that they can surround uh, those kids with the appropriate people, probably that's what uh, uh, that's how people grow in their faith. So, faith, well, faith and trust. With that, I'm going to close this in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for answering uh, my prayer with Joseph. Uh, Lo, those many years ago, you did close doors, you did open doors. We walked through them all to your glory, and we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.